So the inclusion of a tag like TCOT or healthcare or HCR or Pelosi in these examples is less like the Web 2.0 model of tagging, crowdsourced folksonomies for organizing information, than it is like the form of what Manuel Castells has called network making power, particularly switching. So Castells defines switching or making connections between networks as a network activity that allows individuals or actor networks to leverage the resources of other networks. And he argues that digital computing was able to make network structures much more efficient by managing their complexity, thus enabling new forms of network making power like switching and its counterpart programming. The switching resent, or to me, represents one of the primary applications of power within networks, and mastering this skill is a crucial means of influencing the network society, as opposed to network, or excuse me, to societies organized around hierarchies. And according to Castell's power within these networks functions differently than it does within hierarchies. In hierarchies, power is exercised by controlling the upper regions of the hierarchical structure. In networks, however, they don't have that kind of structure. While one can control influential hubs within a network, the fundamental feature of networks is their ability to form and reform connections in multiple directions via multiple paths, thus working around influential or broken hubs if necessary. So in light of this, Castells argues that the power of switching in network structures resides not in controlling various loci within the structure, but the ability to fish, excuse me, the ability to efficiently connect and reconnect nodes in the network to respond to either outside influences or internal goals. So returning to the message by Resistance 09, while it is easy to understand the connections between the shared resource, here for example, it's a website www.freerhealthcare.com, or excuse me, freerhealthcarenow.com and tags like healthcare and HC09, which is another way of indicating that it was about the healthcare debate in 2009. It's less clear how this website is related to the tag Mark Lloyd Resign, a reference to Mark Lloyd, who's the Chief Diversity Officer of the Federal Communications Commission. So as I've argued, from the perspective of semantic tagging, this tag use is difficult to explain. However, from the perspective of network making power, in which individuals leverage network resources to achieve their goals, it's much more intelligible. In this case, Resistance 09 is attempting to connect the movement to challenge democratic health care reform with the conservative backlash against President Obama's establishment of czars within his administration. And it would appear that Resistance 09 was attempting to make a connection between this resource and the exchanges represented by the various hashtags in the tweet. And the high incidence of hashtag use in the data set indicates that this switching behavior was one of the primary functions of the exchange. So what then is the significance of recasting writers not as sources of crowdsourced data in a web 2.0 structure, but as partic participants excuse me, in network exchanges where they practice forms of network making power? So I would say first, they operate in the fashion of workers described by Carl Stoli in 2009, managing their communication environment through the use of network tools for sophisticated customizations and matchups. Or excuse me, matchups. The use of tools like Twitter allows not simply for such sophisticated responses by writers in their work environment, but also allows for the potential of leveraging the power of networks outside of the workplace. Indeed, there's already evidence that professional communicators leverage exchanges like Twitter-based hashtags for information purposes, such as by following and participating in hashtag exchanges from professional conferences like this one that they are not attending. Second, we're accustomed to thinking of networks as being social because prior to digital networking, they almost always were. Yet digital networking makes possible non-social network connections as well. And this claim is not intended to minimize the social, but by emphasizing network features to help us to better understand how communities like TCOT operate in conjunction with less social exchanges like the healthcare exchange. The social is not necessarily inherent in these exchanges. And examining the operation of apparently non-social exchanges can help us better understand their uses for both social and non-social purposes. Put another way, the healthcare tag, like the other hashtags I found in the data, was used to connect messages in the exchange with other networks within the larger Twitter system that were not necessarily connected in other ways, such as through the site's social networking features. As such, hashtags represent an alternative to social media as a means of managing information. And I suggest that an effective means of addressing the role of the writer in this environment is to recast her actions not as social, but as network. And doing so allows for a more sophisticated understanding of writing within network exchanges, suggesting that what may seem like a failed community or monologues that fail to develop into conversation can be better understood as attempts to make connections between networks. And such an understanding can serve to expand our knowledge of the collaboration practices of writers, including not simply social behaviors, but the networks that support these behaviors and the forms of network making power, such as switching, that operate within. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you just need to do it? Well, yeah. Okay. Is that good? No, that's fine. So next up we have 
Kate Lark, who is a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I have no idea what your dissertation is. So. <laughs> My dissertation is about humor and identity politics, and not what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> um, okay, so I think my, my talk is titled Tweet With Me Now, um, and it's about live tweeting. So, so no I live mean, tweeting. yeah, no, li no live tweeting. Please silence your tweets. Okay. Um, so, I had a handy little paper signs, but I left them just to cover so I'm just going to have to announce my tags. Um, prologue. March 2011, I attend my first college conference on composition and communication and lament my lack of either smartphone or tablet with which to join in the Twitter conversation, despite the fact that I am not yet on Twitter. <laughs> May 2012, iPad in hand, I attend my first computers in writing, begin live tweeting panels, and find my Brigadoon. Uh, where once I found, felt profoundly awkward talking to strangers, I find myself with a host of new friends and colleagues. The following week, I attend the Rhetoric Society of America conference, and although the Twitter community there is much smaller, it offers me a safe space in a sea of formal and intimidating academics. And via what was likely just a joke made on the Twitter back channel, this very panel begins to take shape. Initially, my proposal for this conference set out to illustrate the connections between live tweeting and performance theory. Yet, as your humble narrator began to write and work through her ideas, she saw that the connection lay in the relationship between theater and academic conferences. That if we can see a conference as a form of theater, then the call to live tweet is a call for a participatory theater, a call for the emancipation of the spectator. In order to get us there, I'll introduce you to three key players, Paul Woodruff, Richard Lanham, and French philosopher Jacques Rancière, whose emancipated spectator constitutes the main thrust of my argument. And as you've likely noticed by now, I'll be doing it against the backdrop of the conference Twitter feed, a hubbub of noise and activity that seems to call at least for a brief explanation. In crafting a sleek PowerPoint or Prezi to serve as a visual aid, I would be asking that you pay attention to me and my ideas. Not an unreasonable request by any means, but no guarantee that you will. <laughs> and given the technological constraints, the either-or decision necessary in this audiovisual display. Either I could have had a PowerPoint or the live feed. Um, I'm instead inviting you to pay attention to both me and the conversation around us. I see this invitation as a gesture of both trust and respect. I'm encouraging you to literally talk about me behind my back while I make the case for an ethics of participation. Act one, exposition. All the world's a stage, and the, the, all the men and women are merely players. Shakespeare said it first in 1600, and depending on where your ideological inclinations fall, the pro-structuralists proved it in the latter half of the 20th century. But if you're skeptical about Derrida and Butler and the like, then let me introduce you to Paul Woodruff and his ideas about theater. Because my aim in this performance come presentation is to call attention to why we're all here. In the necessity of theater, Woodruff defines theater as, quote, the art by which human beings make or find human action worth watching in a measured time and place, end quote. While he goes on to make distinctions between everyday theater and artistic theater, his broad definition encompasses everything from football games to weddings to college lectures. And at the heart of his argument is a commitment to the ethics of both watching and being watched. For, as he argues, quote, one part of being human is the desire to be watched. Another is the desire to share experiences with members of a community. We become close to each other when we watch the same things, end quote. And so in being here in this room, listening to me recite my lines, you are invited to be a part of this performance. But I also invite you to watch the performance behind me or in front of you, the human activity performed textually in a digital space. And in watching me and or our colleagues, we continue to form and participate in community. For why are we here at this conference in this room if not to build a community, if not to converse and participate? What is the point of an academic conference? Serious question. If simply workshopping ideas, why not write a blog post? Rather than participate in the stasis and safety of the written word, we come together and perform for each other. 
we rehearse our lines, we don our professional costumes, or choose to subvert them, um, and we take our places under typically harsh lighting and ask for our audience's attention. And although those of us less inclined to the spotlight may prefer to forget this, we are fundamentally here to see and be seen. And like it or not, in an economy of attention, the burden of attention ultimately comes down to style. In Richard Lanham's The Economics of Attention, he explores the supply and demand problem of the digital age. While people often speak of the information economy of the current era, Lanham argues that this terminology is misleading. <coughs> Quote, information is not in short supply. We are drowning in it. What we lack is the human attention needed to make sense of it all, end quote. But no one has a monopoly on attention. And if we want our auditors to listen to our ideas, then we have to attend to delivery. And in order to do this, in order to persuade people to pay attention, we have to invite them to participate. Using the example of the artist Cristo, the, famous, the artist famous for wrapping buildings in pieces of, giant pieces of fabric, um, Lanham points to the shift away from objects and towards their wrappers. For Lanham, Cristo's art stems more from the acts of its creation than from the objects themselves. That Cristo's genius lies in the participatory drama his work creates that the amount of effort and attention involved in his projects makes us see our own acting. Quote, it makes us look at our behavior rather than through it. End quote. And in the theater of ideas that academic conferences play out, live tweeting serves as a participatory gesture that calls attention both to what we are saying and why we are here. But as Lanham posits, for a participatory drama to have its persuasive and dramatic vitality, it must include a vociferous opposition. Mm -hmm. Act two, conflict. To tweet or not to tweet, that is the question. In fall of last year, an academic hurly-burly erupted on Twitter <coughs> about the ethics of live tweeting. Eventually dubbed Twittergate by its participants, the conversation raised concerns about live tweeting and escalated to the point of name calling and subsequently deleted tweets. Mm -hmm. um, I was not a part of this, I found out about it later and it's really interesting. Um, much of the conversation is archived in a storify created by Adeline Co. and the initial moderator of the conversation, Tressie McMillan Cottom, afterward wrote a blog post reflecting on the issues raised. In it, Cottom condenses the primary threads of the conversation to four major concerns. First, the etiquette of tweeting during a presentation. People argue that tweeting is a sign of inattention and therefore a mark of rudeness. One opponent asserts that, quote, it is uniformly inappropriate for a participant to tweet during a session and only situationally appropriate for the audience, end quote. The second major thread dealt with anxieties about intellectual property and the co-optation of ideas. Third, the issue of digital branding and the selfish potential of capitalizing on the ideas of others. Some detractors leveled the accusation that live tweeting is a self-serving behavior done to generate a hip digital scholar brand. I see some nods in the background. <laughs> good, good. Um, and finally, people discuss the issue of bad behavior on the back channel. The Twitter date conversation, where I will not stoop to calling it an incident, then prompted an inflammatory chronicle of higher education post titled The Academic Twitteropsy, in which opponents of live tweeting express their views that the practice is distracting to some presenters, a form of neoliberalism, and a byproduct of an intellectually lazy society. <laughs> Strong words. <laughs> and although the defenders of live tweeting offered myriad rebuttals to many of these objections, the surprising vehemence of the antagonism found in the Twittergate conversation does at least give pause to this budding academic with a fondness for tweeting conferences. In my bright-eyed and bushy-tailed enthusiasm, I'll admit that many of these concerns never even occurred to me. I've seen my live tweets as a joyous, positive thing, cheering on my peers and enthusiastically circulating ideas. But reading through the litany of complaints, I can humbly acknowledge that I have used live tweeting as a means to an end. As a result of tweeting at conferences, I've broadened my academic network exponentially in attempting to promote the work of my fellows and share in the conversation of those who are absent, I have reaped some rewards. So what is an honest tweeter to do? Act three. Climax. What can I do but take a stand? Plant my flag on the side of tweeting and defend my position. 
In the age of digital and social media, our utterances are no more safe or at risk than they ever were. It's just more public. Without getting too Derrida on y'all, <laughs> writing and speech depend on the exact same risks. Sharing our half-formed ideas at conferences is just as risky as trying to get them published. It's just perhaps fortunate for us that journals don't publish work that they deem unfit. <laughs> <laughs> to argue that broadcasting publicly presented ideas on Twitter is a violation of privacy is rather absurd. Which isn't to say we shouldn't respect each other. It's polite to ask. If someone doesn't want to be tweeted, we should respect their wishes. But if we aren't here to interact with each other, in person and online, then why are we here? Coming from a background in performance theory, it seems natural for me to think of academic conferences, of, at conferences as a form of participatory theater. As spectators at a conference, we are asked to make choices. <coughs> we have to choose what to go see, and there's a risk in that, often an exciting risk, and sometimes a frustrating one. How often have you found yourself in a panel that turned out to be not quite what you hoped? Hopefully not this one. <laughs> and due to the liveness of the event, the temporality, we are stuck with our choices. And there's something exciting about that. It's what makes conferences what they are. But as spectators to ideological and political events, as most conference speakers are, live tweeting is a means to actively engage with the material, to cheer it on, to push back, to participate. In his book, The Emancipated Spectator, Jacques Rancière argues that, quote, to be a spectator is to be separated from both the capacity to know and the power to act, end quote. To simply spectate a conference panel is to sit quietly and be told what to think. And to remain silent, holding on to your own ideas, is an act of self-censorship. Hmm. Live tweeting offers a mode and platform for engagement. If we are here, performing for and with each other, then, as Rancière would have it, quote, what is required is a theater without spectators, where those in attendance learn from as opposed to being seduced by images, where they become active participants as opposed to passive voyeurs, end quote. Act four, falling action. <laughs> I hope that this presentation will get us thinking about why we tweet. Live tweeting at a conference is an ideological decision about attention, access, and knowing. And I'm not here because I have all the answers. I'm here because I want to talk to you. I'm at this conference, both in person and on Twitter, because I want to ask you what you think. Do you tweet to report, to comment, to record? Who are you tweeting for? If you aren't tweeting, why not? I'm here because I want to be heard, sure, but more than that, I want to incite responses. My 15 minutes of computers and writing fame will not be devoted to a hierarchy of knowledge. I'm not the expert on Twitter or live tweeting or the politics of academia. I know a lot about performance theory, baking, and humor. <laughs> but I aspire to both the humility of constant learning, and here I hope to call forth the responses and engagement from those of you that are both seasoned and novice, that I may learn something new. I hope to bring people together into a sense of community around a particular idea at a particular moment in time. That's what theater does. It tells stories in a given place for a given period of time. Here we share our ideas without the cloak of narrative. And perhaps that rawness is what makes us more sensitive. We don't dress things up with dialogue or plot. And without a whole production crew to back us up, we must stand alone behind our ideas. But the fear of being mistaken, misquoted, or misunderstood can keep us from taking the chance that something new and unexpected might emerge. And there's nothing we can do to escape those risks. Twitter or no Twitter, they are always there. And I see the practice of live tweeting and of presenting at conferences as the journey of Rancière's ignorant student. As he argues, and this is a long quote, <coughs> quote, the distance the student has to cover is not the gulf between her ignorance and the schoolmaster's knowledge. It is simply the path from what she already knows to what she does not yet know, but what she can learn just as she has learned the rest which she can learn not in order to occupy the position of the scholar, but so as to better practice the art of translating, of putting her experience into words and her words to the test, of translating her intellectual adventures for others and counter-translating the translations of their own adventures which they present to her." End quote. What is live tweeting if not the act and test of translation? Whether we tweet to report, to comment, or to record, we must translate and condense our experiences into 140 characters or less 
and test them against the responses of our peers. Act 5, resolution, maybe. At heart, live tweeting not only enacts our experiences of learning, but it also allows for an exciting simultaneity of presence. With an interconnect internet connection in my Twitter feed, I can be in several places at once. While I'm physically here at computers and writing, I can nevertheless stay informed about the RSA Institute, the VAT Camp, and the Digital Humanities Institute that are all apparently happening this weekend as well. Oh and when we live tweet at conferences, something magical occurs. We shift into the liminal space between actor and spectator. We translate and perform ideas for our friends and followers. We extend presence across the campus and out into the world, allowing those who couldn't be here to nevertheless benefit from and participate in the conversation. Fundamentally, to invite the live tweet, say by including one's Twitter handle on one's presentation slides, is to proclaim a willingness to take risks. It's an invitation to the audience asking them to participate, an invitation to ask questions, to promote, to disagree. And it is risky. There's always the potential for misrepresentation, misquotation, mistakes. But again, this is a risk inherent to all language. Live tweeting, tweeting simply amplifies the risk and makes it more public. And it's a risk that I'm willing to take and that I encourage others to take as well. I have seen nothing but the benefits of live tweeting at conferences. I've increased my network exponentially, and I ne have now arranged several conference panels via Twitter. And a whole bunch of you are here, which may have been the result of Twitter, I don't know. But perhaps getting people to come and arranging conference panels is one of the best examples of why live tweeting is both valuable and important. It brings me closer to a community that I hadn't yet met. This is the problem of trying to do something interactive. I think my, oh, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> this is part of the problem with Twitter. My, I have a Twitter bot that I wrote, um, but it's now over the status of it for the day, because I was testing it earlier, so Twitter has banned it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll just, I'll just go without it. Um, the bot that I wrote is um, for, so you can ignore those hashtags. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was, there was supposed to be some interactive nature to it. I'll just go over here. So a game that um, Pete Rorobar and um, Jesse. Jesse Stommel, yes, uh, created is called Twitter vs. Zombies, which was a game to teach digital literacies in a writing classroom that had people tweeting out game actions using hashtags like um, I bite so and so and then they have five minutes to respond with a dodge or somebody else can swipe them away and if that doesn't work they're turned into zombies. And the game lasted for several days and it's run twice now and every it was a crowdsourced game where everybody went through and there was a Google spreadsheet that you shared and you registered through the WordPress site on the Google spreadsheet. And then, as you were turned into a zombie, you would change your status in the spreadsheet, and people were constantly updating this. And so, 
everyone was learning how to use hashtags and learning how to use WordPress and learning how to use Google Docs. And the game itself was quite fun. It was as, as a multiplayer online role playing game um, using Twitter as the platform for which I thought was uh, quite innovative and lots of fun because I like zombies and I like role playing games. <laughs> so I played along and one thing that I discovered while I was playing the game was that we were collaboratively writing a fictional world in 140 characters where people would pretend to be in their <coughs> houses or they would pretend to run away and hide behind buildings and barricades and things. And a lot of people really got into it. The challenge, though, was that along with the, the game playing aspect of it, everyone was tasked with keeping their status updated on the spreadsheet and doing all the, the mechanized aspects of the game that is also necessary uh, to keep this. And, and being a coder, I thought, well, we should automate this. We should have a, a program that's telling us, well, now you can bite, now you can dodge, now you can't do that, and when you get turned into a zombie, uh, it tells you so-and-so is now a zombie. Um, so for the last week and a half or so, I've been trying to write a Twitter bot that will do this. Um, unfortunately, Twitter has blocked me now. Um, but it, it, it's not fully working anyways, so it wouldn't have worked. Uh, my goal was to have us all be able to play a quick, like, kind of lightning round of Twitter versus Zombie using this bot as the game manager during the presentation. Um, so you would join the game, and it says, so-and-so has now joined the game, and then once there's enough people, it begins an outbreak and just randomly infects a few people, depending on what percentage um, I could find. So, one of the really interesting things I found while I was working on this was that there were a lot of implicit rules behind this game that we didn't have to spell out when we played it because mm -hmm. humans are really good at processing language, as you can imagine. Um, and so when I was converting this into something that a computer program could do, I realized I had to abstract the mechanics away and figure out what was going on. Uh, in a way that would be rule-based. Um, this is a, just a configuration file. Um, you can see I've got the initial infection percent at 10%. And it says how long the game lasts and what the different statuses are. And one of the things that I found very interesting was the definition of the different actions. They're all the same. Like when I first started writing the code, I was like, okay, well, I'll write something for biting and something for dodging and something for swiping and something for safe houses and all the different rules that have been built in there. Um, but in fact, they're all in a, in, a, in a mechanized sense, the same thing. They have a hashtag, they have a duration. In the case of a bite, it lasts five minutes. If nobody has canceled that bite, you get turned into a zombie. And then there's an interval on how frequently you can do it. Um, in this case, it's some 60 minutes. First, these, these times are wrong, actually. Um, and it tells you, you know, what status you have to be to do it. Only humans can dodge, only humans can swipe, only zombies can bite. Um, and only, zombies can only bite humans, they can't bite other zombies. And humans can only swipe other humans away from zombies, and it requires a zombie and a human to be in the tweet. And there's all these, these rules, but they're all configurable, and the actions are all the same. Um, and so I found it very interesting that these actions that, when we, when we were playing the game, seemed emergent and the sort of thing that we could just add. And people were adding things like safe houses and extra bytes where you sit, post a picture or you can build a safe house by posting a blog post about the game. So something a little more interactive or a little more, uh, the stakes are a little higher. Uh, but these are all structurally the same that I didn't discover until I tried to mechanize uh, the game. Uh, you can see different ones in here. Um, and the bot itself, um, which is my paper, um, is this. It, and I find it interesting to think of coding as a form of writing, too, that could be extended using this in, in the classroom. Because the, as the game taught a lot of really good digital literacies, there's quite a bit more that we can discuss. Um, when we look at Twitter, for instance, as the human users, we see a tweet, we see who did it, and we'll see, you know, the time, and that's about it. It seems very transparent to us. Um, and but if you look at the Twitter specifications, this is what a tweet looks like to Twitter. And so there's a text. There's entities that get extracted, such as any media, 
like images, um, URLs, user mentions, hashtags. Users have a structure. Everything in Twitter has already been processed. And there's far more than just the text. There's all the metadata around it. And I find that quite interesting when we think of teaching this as a digital literacy of how the writing that we're doing is already being mechanized by Twitter and has all this metadata added and a lot of really great um, attributes that you can pull out when you're looking at the code of it that are just completely occluded when we're actually on Twitter where it just seems like, oh, we're just chatting with friends and short little character bursts. But there's actually quite a bit more going on. And this isn't the full specification even. There's latitude and longitude and a whole host of other things. Um, and at the same time, we could also discuss coding itself as a form of writing, which is probably not too controversial given this conference, but uh, is something that coders themselves don't often consider. Um, coders, if they think of an audience at all, they'll often just consider other coders, but often they don't consider an audience at all. They just, they think, I'm writing for the computer to do things. And so we'll have horrible, horrible variable names like A and B and X <laughs> that mean nothing and functions that mean nothing. And so when I was writing this, I was trying to code in a more humanistic way so that people coming and reading it, even if they don't know how to code, can understand this. And so you'll see a lot of doc strings, for instance, I'm the Twitter versus zombies game manager bot. I separate the quick from the undead. Um, and then every little. <laughs> Every little, I have a function too called quick from undead, that's quite useful. It separates all the players into humans and zombies. Um, and every function in class I've added long doc strings, is what they're called in Python, to help explain it. And I have function names like begin outbreak, um, or update state, or start game, or end game, or register player, things that make sense for humans to read. Um, and this is another way that, you know, for students, I think that maybe already know how to use Twitter and WordPress and are already kind of beyond the, the initial type of digital literacy to be an interesting way to engage them in how writing can take different forms and how we have an audience when we're coding here. And I think it was Robert Frost who maybe apocryphally said that writing free verse is like playing tennis without a net. Um, and I see coding. Um, as a similar thing, whereas there's a lot of rules, just like, say, a sonnet or an epic poem that has all this structure behind it. Um, coding is similar, except that it's the computer that's telling us what the rules are, because we have to, it's writing that has to be functional. Um, it, it, sadly, this one is not right now. Um, that, that's the challenge, and one of the differences, you know, you can write a paper, and maybe it doesn't all fit, but when you're talking, you can paper over that easily. The code either works or doesn't. Um, <laughs> I, I, should, I will say I have a lot of it working. I, you would have been able to join and the game would have started and some of you would have been infected as zombies. Um, but I was desperately trying to get it working this morning and testing it out over and over and sending out all these status updates and now I've been blocked. So in a few hours it'll be working again. <laughs> and once the game is, is actually working, I do plan to have a full Twitter versus zombies game being run through the bot itself so that nobody has to decide when they're a zombie or when they're a human or was that five minutes ago that I was bitten or not. It will just tell you. It will, and I'll show you what that will look like um, just by reading the code. This is um, in Python, all these imports are just other libraries. Um, Twitter returns a data object called JSON um, and you can just read it in. It's, very, it's a very standard thing. Um, when a player gets initialized, th this is another um, interesting, I think, mechanized aspect of the game is that the players can be abstracted to objects with just state, and that's all they have is, have they been bitten? When was the last time they did something? How many times have they done? What is their status? Are they human or zombie? All you have to do is set that up and let it run, and that's all they have to remember. That's all the object has to remember. So every player looks like this. They have an ID, a name, and when they were last attacked by things. Um, the can just decides if they can do something or not, um, and then when you perform an action, all it does is say, the last time I did this was now, the timestamp. Um, how many times I've done it, I've incremented by one just because I'm interested in those stats. And if my action clears any state that I currently have going, remove it. That's all an action does in this game. 
the game listener is not interesting. It just listens to the Twitter stream. Uh, that's just a configuration file. Registering a user. These are there's a lot of kind of validity checking things in here. The begin outbreak one. Um, for the original Twitter versus Zombies game, they just had a patient zero who had unlimited bytes. Um, and I changed it a little bit so that you can set a percentage of people who get infected, and once there's enough people, it just infects them. Um, and so it just goes through, make sure that there's enough people who are not zombies, and then goes through and randomly chooses people and infects them by changing their status to zombie. That's all it is. And then it says, uh-oh, so-and-so has been infected. Um, there's another aspect of, there has to be a periodic check of updating everybody's state. Has somebody who's been bitten, has it been the amount of time that a bite lasts? And if so, then we turn them into a zombie and announce, you're now a zombie, because it's still a collaborative game among people. You don't have to do anything other than keep track of what state people are and what they can do, and then just tell everybody and they'll do it. Because it's still a, col a collaborative writing project. Say, oh, I'm now a zombie. OK, now I'll play as a zombie. And I'll go try and bite people. Uh, it's, it's quite fun. I like playing survive the, the survivors better than the zombies, I think. Um, I always get sad when I get turned. <laughs> um, and this, um, as you can see the thing here, this is the main controller. This is the part where the logic gets a little long. Uh, and I'll ignore all So here is the main logic for the game. And it's, it's actually, again, quite simple. You go through and you say, who are the players who are involved in this tweet? And again, Twitter has this as a data object. It tells you who the mentioned people were. And you can just pull it straight out. You don't have to do any language processing. They've already done it for you. They tell you what the hashtags are. They tell you which other users get mentioned, all of these things. And then you just ask, can that person does that person have a counter on? If so, then you failed. That person's immune. Um, if you can't do that action, then right now, because you've done it too frequently, it says fail, you can't do that. Um, otherwise, it does it and says success. And then people know, hey, my bite worked. Or my dodge worked, I'm no longer, I'm no longer at a threat. Um, and that was, oddly enough, a real aha moment for me while I was writing this, because I was doing the logic, and I was like, what am I going to do next? Oh, I just have to tell people. It's just, a, it's just a Twitter game. I just have to tell people what they're doing. Um, and I, as I was going, I got a little, um, I think, less humanistic in my, in my coding. I started writing some stuff quickly and reverted back to kind of old code thing, old coder practices where you write short variable names because you get tired of typing these really long variable names. Um, and it's also, there's a level of abstraction that happens too, whereas it could be very, very concrete. You could have a function for this person bites and this person swipes and this person dodges. So when you realize that all of these actions can be abstracted to just an action with different attributes, then it starts to get, like I said, more abstract and more generalized in a way that um, I find quite interesting and didn't realize until I started doing this. Um, and, I, and I wrote a bunch of tests um, which to test all the code, and that all works. But for some reason, when you start dealing with Twitter itself, um, you have a, a new layer of complexity involved um, in the system that is not present when you're dealing just with your data alone. Uh, so I will stop there because I could keep talking about code for a while. And we have time for questions. Thank you. So, any questions? Yeah, that's right, I'm the chair. <laughs> <laughs> questions? We've already had questions on the Twitter back channel. John's having a discussion about what makes a network not social or social. <laughs> I, that, yeah, that talk um, is part of a longer article that was cutting things down. And it didn't occur to me until right then that I cut out this whole part. What I was, the distinction I was making was with social networks. Because a lot of, um, you know, obviously any type of interaction between individuals can be described as being social. 
And, and uh, one of the other tensions I'm working against is basically any system can be described as a network. That's a fairly easy and analytical move to make. It's like, hey, there's things, and these things are connected to each other. You can analyze them using graph theory in that way. And uh, for what I'm trying to do, which is connecting uh, network writing, well, networks to writing and rhetorical behaviors, uh, those are a little overly broad. So if everything's a network, it's not really a, a useful term in that context. And so I'm connecting the network making power. And I was specifically in that argument, even though I apparently cut that out of my talk, specifically <laughs> responding to studies of hashtag networks that respond to them as if they're social networks, because they typically happen on, uh, well, hashtag networks happen on Twitter, and it's a social network. And they say that it doesn't have any of these characteristics that we associate with social networks. You're, the interaction, the conversations that occur. And there's a number of different reasons why that might be. Um, but that's the context of sociality. And I can't tweet that anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's a, oh, go ahead. No, you, you said well, I don't know if it's a question, but you, you brought up Kate. Yeah. The uh, question of what a conference is for, it's funny because uh, my wife, is a children's literature person. So okay. She's getting it for a conference. And for her, like I'm doing a talk later, I, I just talk. Yeah. yeah. Got some slides. She's got this whole elaborate sort of like, she's got to cite this and cite that and all this research. And it's a, it's a literary tradition where people stand up and read papers. And they tend to read them very fast because they're too long. And they have all the references in them. And so I guess what I'm getting at is that it is a very discipline-oriented thing what a conference is for, right? I mean, a lot of, in a lot of disciplines, a conference, especially for uh, emerging scholars and graduate students, constitutes scholarship in and of itself. Whereas at a conference like this, has always been kind of a, hey, let's get together and talk about COVID and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I'll stand up this. Um, in some ways, <laughs> this was a difficult paper to write because I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, right? And this is not a traditional or typical conference. And I think what I'm hoping is that we can kind of remember this and take it out into the other conferences, you know, because I go to academic conferences and so I'm a rhetorician, I go to RSA, people write really long, complicated sentences that are hard for my brain to absorb, let alone to tweet. Um, <laughs> You know, and at RSA last year when we were tweeting about Twitter and formed this panel, Colin Brook was going to be a part of that, and he wrote a blog post talking about, like, com who are we composing for? Um, and I think that in the digital age, um, you know, reading these long, like, reading papers at people isn't isn't sufficient. I'm going to take that stand. It is is that like we have to be thinking of it like and, and I think this is a debate that people have about you know is it about delivery is it about style etc. And I think it has to be um, because with gizmos in front of them you will lose people. Um, and and one of the objections on the on the Twitter gate conversation was well what's the difference between having an iPad or an iPhone out and taking notes. Mm -hmm. Right? And one of the responses that I really liked said um, that it's just a more visible form of inattention, or seems like a more visible form of inattention. Um, I think there are a lot of assumptions at more traditional conferences that if you're messing with something, you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of we need to broaden the fact that that's just not implicitly true anymore. Um, and, and what you're making me think of is um, kind of the difference between seeing a band live and listening to a CD. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure where my brain is going here, but but I, I was thinking for, for my own presentation for here. I, I um, was recording kind of a draft version of myself talking, mm. mixed in with some of the sounds I'm going to play, and, I, and then I was listening to that to try to figure out what I wanted to cut. And then I wondered why why am I even doing the presentation if I have this recorded version? Can I just get right? It well, exactly. That was, that was an interesting thought that I was having when you're like, I'm here to record, you know. Um, and so I mean, and this is this is where my scholarship goes is kind of performance theory and liveness right. and the relationship between us being here in this room and me being able to look at your faces and hopefully see some smiles and some nods um, 
or some confused looks, and like responding to that. And there's the same conversation going on you know, with some genres of music more than others. Mm -hmm. and there's classical pianists who just left stage because someone was videoing and wouldn't stop videoing. So the, kind of that people in the audience wanting to archive, but also wanting to engage in some way, mm -hmm. and wanting to see the live thing because there's something different about the live thing. I don't have the answer, but it, right. I, I like the... Well, and, and I think that the, the huge difference for me in, in the liveness of conferences is that as an audience member, like, you get to have some agency, or at least I want you guys to have some agency, right? Like, I, I, I as a presenter, want to be factoring in how you're responding to whatever I'm saying. And yes, that happens in the Q&A, but sort of in general, um, I think that it, it should be a more community-centered and group-based thing that we're doing, not me standing up here saying what I think and letting you guys absorb that, <laughs> right? Um, and, that's, and, that's, and that's me, and that's sort of my kind of ideological position, um, which I decided to broadcast to everybody. <laughs> 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 and it'll be curious to see what sort of backlash that gets, because I know some people disagree, and that's great. So. It does highlight the, that, that you know, regardless of what the tradition is, the, the whole saying out loud, I'm going to write a paper to read to people. Well, no, just mail me the paper and I can read right. it in my pajamas. <laughs> and, or yeah, right. let's just digitally send it out and do it asynchronously, asynchronously and people can respond. I mean, right. So it's impossible to separate that performance aspect. And, and you are here to share the ideas and to get the interaction. Otherwise, we'd all be sitting home reading a journal. Right. Although, what's, what's interesting is there's a lot of fields and a lot of conferences in which the premise is you write a paper, it's set around, everybody reads those papers, and then what we would be doing at this is not listening to you read your performance. Right, we would just be chatting about that because the mm -hmm. presumption was we'd all have done that right. ahead of time. And I think but it requires people to actually do it ahead of time. Sure. And then, <laughs> then in essence, you're it's the same behavior, it's just not being used by Twitter. Yeah. yeah. In, in a so. way, yeah. Well, it makes interesting power dynamics, too, just something mm -hmm. that's going up for tenure, and there are people who are evaluating them from other disciplines, and they're like, well, put in the paper. I was like, well, the PowerPoint that I wrote, you know, and, and so this idea that you're sloughing off. Right. Oh, I have, I have a question for Michael. Yes. Um, can you uh, can you say more about how invisible code affects this? Yeah, I saw that tweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one the one first I would point to the, there was a um, Haystack Scholars Forum on critical code studies I think a year or two ago um, that discusses that general question in great detail. Um, in the case of Twitter itself, I don't know that the metadata is affecting us in ways that we don't see unless maybe you're inadvertently geotagging all of your tweets and people can track you. Um, but I find it useful when thinking about teaching digital literacies to separate for students the, the distinction between what we see and what the computer sees and how the data is formatted for us, for our own consumption differently than how Twitter actually looks at it. And you know, whatever's going into the, the Library of Congress archive is not just the text, it's all the metadata, it's the time it was tweeted, all of these things that are somewhat hard for us to access generally. And so I think it's a matter of just furthering um, our literacy in this and understanding that there is code that we can access going on behind all of this. Yeah. I'm curious too, Michael, about the, the coding side of, of, of things. Um, given that, um, say for example, Carnegie Mellon has a center for computational thinking, mm -hmm. um, where their premise is that you know, the thought processes that are involved just in formulating the problems themselves before we can solve them via code is essentially what, what you took us through in your narrative, in your mm -hmm. pseudocode. You, you took, assumably, you know, folks who can't program from scratch in Python, mm -hmm. through your process, you, you stepped us through that program, you did the trace for us and the logic. Um, and I'm curious if, if you have sources that you, you could share with us, the people you're reading and inform your work that, um, that are involved with computational thinking in ways that reach out to, a com you know, to, to this sort of audience, because mm -hmm. it seems we're still a little too culturally here, and every now and then, um, somebody like you shows up and does, I think, an amazing presentation and 
that has the guts nerve whatever to put Python and <laughs> I couldn't tell what your ID was on the on Eclipse. This, on Eclipse. <laughs> That's what that was my quick guess in the in the tweet that um, it was Eclipse. Um, so can you take us through maybe like who who influences you so you can get up here and do that and also any ideas you have about getting more of that yeah. in a conference like this? Um, I I have to say I don't have any specific names that are saying you should go right. It, it's it. I have friends who are coders and I've been a coder for a long time, but uh -huh. I'm also a humanist. I'm trained as a medievalist, in fact. Um, and it's the for me, it's it's a subjective sense, in fact, because when I'm writing a paper, and I think you've all felt this, you get into that flow state, right? Where it's, if somebody interrupts you, you're going to forget what you're going to say next or you're going to forget your phrasing, and you really get into the groove of your writing. And that happens in coding, too, where you, you get, it's actually more intense than that, where if somebody interrupts a coder while they're in the middle of it, they lose their entire stack and have to start over. Um, and, and a lot of coders tend to be asocial anyway, so not all of them, but they tend to self-select for that. Um, and I've had this conversation with um, a good friend of mine who's been a professional coder for like 20, 25 years about how writing is very much, and particularly creative writing. Creative writing to me, like when you're in the middle of writing a poem, feels very much like writing computer code. You know, the, the mental state is very similar and the sense of flow is very similar. Um, and to then kind of take that back and think about coding as having an audience beyond the computer, because the computer's not really the audience. If the computer were the audience, we wouldn't have variable names or anything like that. It would just be machine code like what they used to do, where you just put all the numbers on a punch card and run it through. Um, the audience is other people and is other coders, um, but it's something that gets, I think, um, bypassed a lot of times. Uh, there's there's some books called like The Literate Programmer um, and others where, um, for instance, I have um, a tab up here from Jeff Atwood talking about the unexpected relationship between writing code and writing and the nature of the, a need. He actually refers to Strunk and White here, and talking about style in code. And if you look through people's code, you really have a sense of style. This is a conversation I've been having with um, Elijah Meeks, who is the digital humanities specialist at Stanford, and he writes a lot of JavaScript for these really great um, projects that he works on. Um, but he freely admit that his style is awful, and he has no comments and it's hard for him to maintain as a result. Um, and so I think I think the parallels are, are quite common. I'm sorry I don't have any specific names to share with you, but hopefully I can answer your yes. comments. So, oh, you. I'll go back to the Twitter feed here. <laughs> yes. I mean, I guess to that question, I, I'm someone who feels very intimidated by learning how to code. I've started and stopped it so many times that I, I consider myself a complete coding wimp at this point. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I guess what I'm wondering is, um, you know, someone who's kind of drawn to, to writing and humanities-based work, um, I found that the logic of coding was really different to me than the logic of, of writing an essay or thinking about textual prose. So how did you make that transition in your own thinking about your work from a medievalist to, you know, a coder, <laughs> or well, maybe back and forth? They are different, right? It's, it's, it's more like trying to write a villanelle or something, mm -hmm. where you have all these rules that yeah. are constraining your creativity. Um, but in, I think, generative ways. Um, but it's also, you know, when, if you look at a lot of the advice to like how to get your article published, like, a lot of it is like phrase it as a problem and a solution, right? And in this case, the problem was humans are not very good at keeping up with the mechanics of a game and updating the state and people forget it and get bored or drop out. And so it seems like the computer should do that. And so that was my, my proposed solution for it. Um, you're right, it is a different way of thinking because you have to always be thinking both within the grammar of what the compiler or the interpreter will allow um, and thinking in terms of variables and recursion and functions and things like that. Um, but you can, I think, too, start at a, a, a more kind of accessible level where you just make it all kind of linear, the way an argument flows in a paper sometimes. Right? Here's my thesis, and here are the, the subpoints. And in this case, you know, the thesis would be update people's state, right? And then you have to step through the logic of it. Um, it's there. There are differences, obviously, um, and I'm, I'm still trying to think through the ways that they are parallels because you know a function is not the same thing as a paragraph. 
um, and the audience is not always the same. And there are, we have more freedom and more rhetorical strategies that we can draw on in human writing um, than in, in computer writing. Um, and it is, a, it is a different way of thinking, but the, the, the parallel for me just comes from the feeling I get when I'm in the process of writing something where it's like ideas are just kind of appearing out of seemingly the air and I write them down and you know, like you say a poem, you know, well this line doesn't quite work. I feel like it doesn't work and you have to be the debugger. Whereas here you have a computer telling you, no, that doesn't work, go fix it. So, that's the best I can say. <laughs> so. occurred to me that I could actually ask you in person the question that I asked you. <laughs> um, but I was asking John about, um, he was talking about how he moved away from an ecological approach to um, the networking approach because you said that mm -hmm. you wanted a more active instead of descriptive approach to describing networks. Um, and you say it's because describing power and citation networks does not explain how to gain power. My question is, um, if you're describing the power, are you not also describing how to gain power? Is Are those power gains are not also being described, you know, when you're using ecological, ecological approaches? What's the difference there? Sometimes. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer this in uh, the network context, right? Yeah. Um, because that's one thing. And I, my feelings, I'm still working through the ecological. We were talking about um, ecologies and composition. Uh, so the internet uh, consists of, or at least the, the World Wide Web consists of hypertext pages that are linked to each other, right? And those links are always kind of accessible to users. And what you can do is you click on them, obviously, go to another page. And what uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page did was they said, oh, hey, you know, this is like a citation network. And, you know, uh, network scholars have been interested in citation networks for a really long time. And they use it to kind of map power within uh, academic networks. If everybody's citing Scholar X, then Scholar X has a certain amount of power. And having that information doesn't explain, in that context, it doesn't explain how you become Scholar X. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. It just says, in this particular network, Scholar X possesses the power, we can deduce that power because, or possesses power, we can deduce that power because of the kind of connections in the network. And they said, well, that's, that's a really brilliant way of talking about quality, too. That a lot of people are linking to Scholar X, and obviously there's something good about Scholar X, and we can apply that to the network, or to the internet, because there's all these links that are connecting everything. And they created PageRank. Anybody not familiar with PageRank? How it works? Um, and I argue that prior to when they did that, that network was not really, it was just a descriptive one. Like, there was a bunch of links on the internet, but they didn't really mean what um, Page and Brin turned it into. Because they turned it into a way of not just of mapping where those links go, but manipulating <coughs> that map. Where all of a sudden, prior to Page Rank, we didn't have link farms and pages filled with MetaStan and um, you know, Link Bait and just all the other stuff that Page Rank created as a way of manipulating the citation map. And in addition to, that was a particular, that algorithm itself was a particular bit of writing that turned a descriptive network, like we can talk about these citations that exist. And one of the other huge problems with the internet is a citation map is no one can access all of it. Like it was literally impossible for a human being to be aware of where all those citations were coming from, the types of relationships that they indicated, and following them all out, and deducing anything from them. And they created this algorithm that not only mapped all that out, and explained uh, where the nodes of power were, but also provided a means of creating your own nodes of power within the context of page rank that had nothing to do with their original intent, which was determining quality. And in that context, uh, Castells talks about four types of power, which it will sound really tough. It's networking power, networked power, network power, and network making power. And the one that he focuses on is network making power, which is the one programming and switching. And he would describe, and I'm actually going to get this mixed up in a moment. 
trying to think of a way to describe citation uh, networks you would describe as network power, just mapping out the, net, the uh, power that exists in the network. And the argument that I make is that they moved that from a network power where just there was some power here and you can look at it and say there it is, to one that you could uh, manipulate you know, to a certain extent. And also they have a lot of power because if you try and manipulate it in a way that they don't approve of, they will wipe it up. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so connecting that to, that's why I really latched on to network making power. Not that you can't do, not that describing relations of power is in all cases is not useful in the way that you said it, but it's not always. Thank you. I find it really interesting that you're talking about like no like central nodes as power. Mm -hmm. Because this is not how people in network theory discuss them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like right. you have your you know, your, you have centrality in between the centrality and average degree and path and it's all very kind of neutral and technical and scientific mm -hmm. sounding. Um, but from a humanistic standpoint, you know, you're the most central node, right? And everybody runs through you, or you, or even more importantly, you connect to disparate communities that if you were gone would be completely separate. Mm -hmm. That is a form of power, but it's not something that network scientists often discuss. Right, and it's not necessarily, yeah, yeah. And like I think graph theory is really useful, but right, it has a more descriptive function. It's different than thinking about how do I write something viral, yeah. which I think is a it doesn't explain that necessarily. Everybody's busy on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Is that all the questions that we have? In person. All the in person <laughs> questions, yes. We can continue on Twitter. Okay, well. Yeah, thank you all for coming.